Good afternoon, morning, or evening to all of you from wherever you are in the world. A very warm welcome to our event, Cities Possibilities 2021 Net Zero Cities. My name is Megan C, Director of Partnerships at EcoBusiness, Asia Pacific's leading media and intelligence organization dedicated to sustainable development and responsible business, and I'm delighted to be your host today. Before we begin, I'd like to go through some COVID-19 housekeeping measures for our in-person speakers and, and guests. All guests today should be fully vaccinated and microphones will be wiped down after each use. Speakers can remove their mask on stage to facilitate the event where we will ensure a one meter social distancing rule. Speakers are to then put on their mask right after before leaving the stage. Cities Possibilities, now in its third edition, is a premier sustainable cities event that brings together high level decision makers from the building, finance and infrastructure sectors government, academic, and civic society to discuss the latest developments in advancing Sustainable Development Goal 11, creating sustainable cities and communities. This is also the first year we have run this event in a hybrid format with in-person guests here at the St. Regis Hotel at Singapore and live streaming it to more than 600 of you joining us virtually from all over the world. The event will feature a hybrid format opening plenary, exclusive in-person roundtables, and finally a closing live stream plenary where key stakeholders will share insights to the respective roundtable discussions, highlighting the key challenges and opportunities to achieving net zero cities. To all our guests today, please do engage with our discussions by taking part in our polls and interactive Q&A. Our hashtags for today, cities possibilities, net zero cities, EB conversations, and COP26. Before we kick off the event today, I'd like to thank all our partners without whom this event would not have been possible. This year's edition is brought to you by our strategic partners, Canopy Sands and City Developments Limited. We are also very pleased to have Arcadis and DSM as supporting partners, as well as the Knowledge Partners, Centre for Livable Cities and Resilient Cities Network. Thank you to all of you for working with us on this very timely forum. For now, please sit back and enjoy the City's Possibilities 2021 Net Zero Cities video, which we have prepared especially for you. I hope all of you enjoyed that video as much as I did, which sets us up nicely for our day of discussion. While cities cover only 3% of the Earth's land surface, they create more than 70% of all carbon emissions, mainly from buildings, energy, and transport. Currently, half of the world's populations live in cities, and this is projected to rise to about 6.5 billion by 2050. This will result in new construction of buildings and modes of transportation, amongst others resulting in even higher energy consumption and carbon emissions as well. We know that in order to keep global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius and below, we need to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Even with the COVID-19 pandemic still affecting millions of lives and which forced countries into lockdowns, the global carbon emissions in 2020 still exceeded that in 2015, the year nations entered into the Paris Agreement by 2%. 
Unfortunately, the UN Environment Program's latest emission gap report 2021, The Heat Is On, which was released ahead of the ongoing COP26, finds that new and updated climate commitments fall far short of what is needed, leaving the world on track for a global temperature increase of at least 2.7 this century. The report, however, finds that net zero pledges could make a big difference. If fully implemented, these pledges could bring the predicted global temperature rise to 2.2 degrees Celsius, providing hope that decisive action can still alleviate the impacts of climate change. While many cities are increasing their commitments on becoming net zero carbon emitters, we still have a long way to go. Climate change is accelerating, and we need simultaneous action on multiple fronts, and especially a built environment, mobility and transportation, technology, agriculture, and resources. This is also why we have decided on these five roundtable discussion tracks. How will we ensure quality life for all living within our planetary boundaries and achieving net zero as demand for energy, food, water, and, inf and infrastructure increases? In this 2021 edition of Cities Possibilities, we will provide the platform for high-level decision makers to discuss pathways to net zero as we look to opportunities and challenges in Asia in the next decade. It is our hope that you will come away from this forum not just with content and insights, but also with some hope. On this note, I am very pleased to welcome on stage our guest of honour, Her Excellency Cara Owen, British High Commissioner to Singapore, to give this year's opening keynote address. Good, that's what I thought. Um, hello everybody, thank you so much, uh, Megan, for that introduction, and thank you so much for our friends at Eco Business uh, for having this event, uh, particularly in this week. Um, as I'm speaking now, the day is dawning on day three at COP26 in Glasgow. I hope it's good weather for them there. Um, I have myself our Prime Minister's words ringing in my own ears. Um, this is our last best hope of taking action to bend the emissions curve. And uh, if I wasn't going to be persuaded by all scientific evidence uh, and by the words of my own Prime Minister, which every High Commissioner should be, um, I would be persuaded by the urging from Sir David Attenborough and Her Majesty the Queen, uh, both of whom have uh, much more wisdom than I have myself about the need for the world not to squander the moment that COP26 presents for all of us. It's truly a pivotal moment for the world to come together to enhance our climate ambition, bringing all parts of society along with us to address this global crisis. The theme of COP26 today um, is finance. We'll be particularly focusing on how we can unleash finance to enable a green transition. It's been a defining theme of my conversations here, uh, probably, I think, uh, since Prime Minister Lee's National Day rally speech in August uh, uh, 2019. Uh, Singapore, of course, is a global financial centre that has already taken really strong steps and signalled further steps uh, to be taken to direct money towards green opportunities. Our single biggest goal, of course, is the one that um, Megan has already mentioned. It's about keeping global warming, uh, keeping the global warming scenario of 1.5 degrees within reach at all, and we're not on that trajectory at the moment. We know that no one country can win this fight alone. It's a crisis without borders, which will require all parts of society to change, to mitigate, and adapt to the impact of climate change. The science is really clear about the urgency. Um, uh, as Megan mentioned, the IPCC uh, 6 report and the UN Secretary General said we're at code red for humanity. Um, we know that temperature rises above 1.5 degrees look increasingly catastrophic. At 2 degrees, 10 million more people globally are at risk from rising sea levels than if we'd kept it to 1.5 degrees. 
And at two degrees, the global economy will lose an additional $1.4 trillion from its GDP than it would have under a 1.5 uh, degree scenario. That scenario and the cat catastrophe it will unleash for our populations, our economies, and our relationships uh, truly terrifies me. So to keep 1.5 degrees alive, the world must get to net zero by 2050, and it must halve emissions by 2030 globally. The alarm bells are ringing particularly loudly for those of us that are in the ASEAN region. Five of the 20 medium and large economies most affected by climate change are in this region. Climate change could cut over 35%, a whopping 35% of the region's GDP by the middle of the century if we don't get a grip on it. And we know that urban populations in particular will endure the health and well-being impacts of high levels of pollution and projected increases in temperature. The ADB says that there will be an additional 200,000 pollution-related deaths a year across this region by 2040 on our current trajectory, while sea levels could rise by nearly a metre by the end of the century. And that's, of course, why our role as COP26 president um, has been taken extremely seriously by our government, by our private sector, by the whole of our diplomatic network in the run-up to this meeting and planning for beyond this meeting. Next Thursday at COP26, the world will discuss in Glasgow the threat to the urban environment during a day specifically focused on cities and the built environment. And I'm really pleased that some of you who are sitting here today will be there to take part in that discussion next week. At COP26, we're encouraging countries, cities and businesses alike to make the boldest commitments possible. On net zero, we've seen a surge of political announcements around COP26. In ASEAN, five countries have already set a, a date, a firm date for carbon net zero, including Indonesia, who's chosen 2060, Laos 2050, Malaysia 2050, Vietnam 2050, and Thailand 2065. We have hopes that others will be joining uh, from within this region, um, and we're very hopeful that all countries will want to be in that majority. We're also seeing businesses move in line with the Paris Agreement by supporting the Race to Zero, which is the world's largest net zero alliance. The alliance now represents 25% of global CO2 emissions and around 50% of global GDP. Over 30 Singaporean firms are members, some of whom I'm delighted to see are with us today. I thank you wholeheartedly for your leadership. This is all really welcome progress, but it still won't be enough. We must continue to push further and at faster pace. For an advanced, globally connected, space-constrained city-state like Singapore, I know that the challenges are manifest. But I feel really inspired when I hear Singapore ministers, officials, and corporates also talk about the opportunities. The transition to a greener, more resilient, and inclusive economy is not a binary choice for growth. As our Prime Minister said to ASEAN businesses this week, our experience is that there are two sides of the, they are two sides of the same coin. Last month, the UK published its own net zero strategy, detailing how we'll hit net zero by 2050, while strengthening our position in the global economy. It explains how we'll cut emissions across key sectors, such as power, industry, heat, and buildings. We've now committed to decarbonizing the UK's electricity system 15 years ahead of our previous target. We hope that others will be inspired by these decisive actions and use this work to help inform their own respective strategies. It would be really foolish of me to say that we haven't made mistakes uh, along our own path or that we have all the answers. We absolutely don't. Uh, but we're really happy to share our experience with those interested and also to learn from others and their own innovative solutions. We firmly believe that signalling a clear direction towards net zero across the whole of the economy underscores a rapid economic recovery. It can drive rather than deter investment from the private sector, for example. McKinsey's analysis last year said economies would create nearly four times as many jobs by investing in renewables as you would from investing in fossil fuels. And another study showed that you were way more likely to have um, gender diverse workforces in the energy sector if you were working in renewables rather than traditional fossil fuels. Um, the nearly 
20 billion Singapore dollars in FDI that the UK has attracted in support of our own net zero strategy shows that can be possible. In Singapore, with its 2030 green plan as the catalyst for further action, the economy is definitely already shifting, recognizing the opportunities for the financial, technology, and transport sectors, which are so intrinsic to growth here. I'm hopeful we'll, continue, we'll see continued leadership from Singapore uh, this week and next week in Glasgow. We appreciate the challenges and Singapore's well-respected determination to have a clear transition path to underpin genuine commitments. But I haven't entirely lost hope uh, that uh, soon we will have a clear date for the net zero commitment. With respect to cities, there are some concrete questions being discussed at COP26. On transport, of course, we want to bring an end to diesel and petrol vehicles that pollute our cities and have dominated the global market for over a century. We want to end their sale by 2040 at the very latest. By sending a strong policy signal to the global industry, we can scale up investment faster and accelerate cost reduction. We've seen already uh, what has happened on electric vehicles with respect to battery cost, as I was discussing with a participant just before we came in here today. We want to use our presidency of COP26 to bring stakeholders together to achieve an accelerated goal. We've got one of the most globally ambitious targets to date. We've committed to ending the sale of combustion engine vans and cars by 2030. And uh, all cars must be fully zero emissions capable by 2035. I've been pleased to see that Singapore has also taken steps to ensure that all on-road vehicles will be EV or hybrid by 2040. That's really welcome progress, and I'm sure our kids' lungs will thank us. <laughs> On finance, greening finance and financing green is, of course, the key to rapid decarbonisation. Financing green uh, means that we need the richest nations, we've, which have historically produced so much of the world's carbon, to recommit to supporting the rest of the planet to go green with funds of 100 billion US dollars a year. We have doubled our own climate finance commitment. And the, um, and the G7 presidency has now secured strong commitments on that from all other members. Despite these achievements, we've been transparent about the realities of public finance pledges and the challenges that remain. The COP26 presidency has published a dedicated delivery plan led uh, with our gratitude by ministers from Canada and Germany. It confirms the goal will be met by 2023. That is later than we all wanted, uh, but we have a clear trajectory. And that 500 billion um, US dollars will be delivered uh, between 2021 and 2025. In some ways, though, public financing won't touch the sides. We need a revolution in the amount of private finance pointing towards green projects. We need to rewire the system to transition the sector to a deeper shade of green. To unleash the trillions in private finance required for mitigation and adaptation, every financial decision needs to take climate into account. It requires every company, every financial firm, every bank, and every insurer to hardwire that into its processes, its risk analysis, and its decision making. Every city sparks innovation and dynamism, including in the financial sector. And I know that Singapore takes very seriously its responsibilities as a regional and global financial hub. It's made clear its ambition to be a catalyst for change across this region. Through the Glasgow Financial Alliance, over 90 trillion US dollars in global financial assets are now under committed net zero mandates. And Singapore's decision to mandate best practice climate impact disclosure will help secure its role in funneling investment into the region's huge green growth opportunities. I was delighted to see Singapore Stock Exchange join the alliance last month and DBS coming on board as the first Singaporean bank to do so last week. I hope Singapore's other major financial institutions will follow those examples. That's why the UK has been working so closely with Singapore on green finance during our presidency. Our renewed financial partnership, which was signed in June this year, is designed to help accelerate the pace in ASEAN through better assessment of climate and nature-related risk and disclosure, as well as developing a highly integrated voluntary carbon markets that are truly Paris-aligned. On nature, Singapore has a fantastic vision of being a city in nature, which has taught its population the value of the environment. And I think over the last 
18 months or so, we have all uh, renewed our appreciation for the nature that surrounds us. My 10-year-old daughter has truly taken to heart the vision of Singapore's founding father and government since then to ensure the urban population and nature can live side by side. We can only combat the climate crisis through humanity's strong partnership with nature. The pandemic has woken us up to the significance of this relationship. Over the last two years, uh, it has brought um, that even more to light here, in, uh, here and in other urban environments. For many, green spaces have been an absolute lifeline uh, during the stresses of the pandemic period. And that's why restoring nature is one of the priorities of COP26. Over 100 world leaders have promised to end deforestation by 2030 uh, earlier this week. We know that effectively mobilizing nature-based solutions is our best defense against climate change. The potential in this region is huge, as we all know. Nature-based solution projects in Southeast Asia have a return on investment potential of 27.5 billion US dollars per year, yet only 3% of green finance is currently spent on them. And that comes from uh, a COP26 report uh, uh, focused on ASEAN. I want to end by highlighting the role cities and states can play in demonstrating the huge momentum behind uh, achieving the Paris goals. The task is not just for national governments, so what can cities and states do now? They can set net zero commitments by 2050 with credible short-term strategies. Joining the city's race to zero is one great way that that can be achieved. They can define specific commitments on sector transformations, for example, in buses or in buildings. They can lend experience and voice to national policy making. They can mobilize key stakeholders, such as mayors, to showcase place-based policy making that works. And that's why today's event is so important. This is a historic moment for humanity and for our own future. I encourage everyone here that has not done so already to step up at this critical hour. Thank you very much. Thank you to Your Excellency Cara Owen for formally opening the city's possibilities 2021 during the week of the UK's COP26 presidency held in partnership with Italy. The insights you shared with us were invaluable. We will be having a special keynote later by Mr. Kong Wing Fook, Managing Director, Canopy Sense Development later on. But for now, we'll now move on to our much awaited opening plenary. I'm delighted now to hand you over to Eco Business's Founder and Managing Director, Jessica Chiam. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And thank you again to High Commissioner Cara Owen for sharing your point of view on this very historic time, like you mentioned. I'd now like to invite the opening plenary speakers up on stage to join me. And as our speakers make their way to the stage, I'd like to invite all our delegates to answer this poll that we have prepared for you. We will take this into the opening plenary, so for our in-person guests and those who are joining us online, you can scan this QR code and you will see a question that we would all like you to answer. And that question is, name one action we can take today which will accelerate our path to net zero cities. Just one word, one action, and we'll be able to see the results. Prof, you think here at this side? Yeah, we'll have alternate, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have alternate, yeah. They will turn they will turn it on here. Yeah. Alright. 
Okay, so we can see now, name one action we can take today and the results are coming in and it's really interesting to see what people are saying. Reduce, go plant-based, public transport, technology, policy, lots of interesting words here. Stop deforestation. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for your insights and I would like now really to introduce our distinguished speakers this morning. Uh, we've heard from Her Excellency and I will now introduce the other panellists. We have Professor Lam Kipo, Provost Chair, Professor of Architecture and Building at National University of Singapore and also Board of Directors at Centre for Livable Cities. We have Ms Esther N, Chief Sustainability Officer, City Developments, also Strategic Partner to Cities Possibilities. And we also have Wayne Gordon, Executive Director, Chief Investment Office, Global Wealth Management at UBS. Thank you speakers for taking the time to be with us today and thank you to all our in-person and virtual guests. You know, I was thinking about how to start this opening plenary and uh, I have to say that when I think about COP26, the first thing I think about is the James Bond theme tune. And that is no thanks to uh, our, the UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson who invoked um, the James Bond character as saying, a red digital clock ticks down remorselessly to a detonation that will end human life as we know it. And we are roughly in the same position, my fellow global leaders, as James Bond today. Well, I'm not sure if everyone can relate to James Bond in the same way, but I thought this idea of the clock ticking and billions of engines pumping carbon in the air as a rather graphic and realistic way to bring home the point. And I think if you think about the statistics I think one of them that's worth acknowledging here is that despite the unprecedented lockdown that we've seen from the global pandemic, carbon emissions continue their onward march. And we've heard all the warnings, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, because this conversation today is about the way forward and steps that each of us can take in whatever capacity that we work in to help play a part in this transition towards net zero. Cities are the cradle of human civilizations, and they play a role in shaping humanity's future. And it is within this context that we will deliberate the pathways that we will take to net zero. And so, as we've heard from High Commissioner already, I will first invite uh, Ms. Esther N to give her thoughts on the subject before ensuing a Q&A. I'd like to invite everyone to keep uh, engaged by sending your questions into the Slido QR code that will be shared later, in person and online. So without further ado, Esther, over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, we are here to see whether we can uh, uh, act like James Bond, saving the days all the time and turning impossible to possible. Um, I'm a James Bond fan all, all this year. And uh, I think um, um, High Commissioner's view is very clear. The government will, international will is, is there. And uh, we hope to see COP26 will come up with really tangible targets and all. And uh, I think now the science is really clear. Now is we have to look at the art of engaging people and uh, also running the business. How do we embrace ESG into the business to create value and also to future-proof our business? So the other part is also the economies. The economic driver is also very clear. And uh, then the last thing is about humanity. So the art and science, humanities and economies are all needed to drive this, you know, uh, uh, actions to net zero. And to tell the truth, since February, we pledged to, you know, um, uh, 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 commit to World Green Building Council's net zero. I have a lot of sleepless nights, really always dreaming of like zero. So I think to set ambitious target is very important because that is to really power, you know, to push the engine. Without setting ambitious targets, you don't know your direction. And it will really speed it up. And then we actually, last year, we set up a sustainable innovation team dedicated to green building technology and innovation. No point to use for, for us to set a target, but not acting on it. So everyone is really pushing to the same direction. That is what we need, you know, to turn, you know, um, impossible to possible. So we still have nine years. We need to speed up because we do not have, you know, when we first started uh, concept, you know, to conserve as we construct was 1995. At that time, nobody talked to me, you know, nobody, you know, really interested to talk about green building or, you know, going green. But today, everybody is on board. And along the value chain, we can engage the public sector, the regulator, and of course, uh, one very important 
uh, you know, engine for change is about money. So financial investors are very important. And of course, we need supply chain to come on board. Okay, we need the architect, we need the consultants, engineer, and also supply chain to be on board. And innovation technologies are very important. That's why I'm really glad to have our partner here and, uh, you know, from NUS that we have partnered since 2016. We set up two labs at NUS. Uh, one is called the uh, 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 Smart Green Home Lab. The other one is actually the uh, Tropical Technology Lab because Singapore is heating up you know, twice as fast as other parts of the world. So cooling our living and workspace is very important. So we have actually started the, you know, uh, um, R&D even before the actual lab was even set up. And we are really, really honoured to be, you know, partnering together, looking at not just physical green building features, but also uh, last year because of COVID, we actually came up with some pilot schemes together to pilot uh, uh, antiviral, you know, uh, um, uh, adhesive film at our Republic Plaza as well. So sustainability is not just about, you know, uh, decarbonisation. We also have to look at how do we engage people, and uh, the economy is very clear now. Business case is really, really strong. Even you don't do it, actually investors are asking for it. I mean, look at the letter from uh, um, Larry Fink and the, from uh, BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world. And uh, this year's letter is no longer asking, asking for climate uh, strategy from investing company. He specifically say net zero strategy and net zero goals. If investing company do not have that, you are having the risk be, you know, for being divested and your directors being outvoted. So there's also cause for inaction because, I mean, the, the, the case is really clear, not about improving operational efficiency, not just about preparing for regulatory change. That's also cause of inaction. Your investor may, you know, screen you out, banks may, may not even lend money to you, and insurance companies may not even, you know, uh, insure your, your, your property if they are deemed as, you know, facing very high level of like, you know, a rising sea level or other climate threats. And the consumers moving forward will be a big driver. In ASEAN, we have a relatively younger uh, uh, population, about 60% are 35 and below. And the Gen Z, we are not just even talking about millennial, even the Gen Z has, has already started working, some of them. So these are the really powerful force for change, whether it is, you know, among your executive employees or your consumers or investors. So the direction is very clear. So as business, you know, you can't, you know, run away. You have to ask how fast you can go rather than why you should, you know, um, adopt, you know, a uh, net zero possibility. Yeah. Thank you so much, Esther, especially for CDL's corporate leadership for setting that net zero target. I think we've seen a lot of corporate pledges uh, doing that, but the how, I think, is still a question mark, and uh, it's really great to hear you uh, talk about your plans. I want to move to Professor Lam. Um, as Provost Chair, Professor of Architecture and Building at NUS, and also on the board of CLC, you've worked on this issue on low energy buildings and net zero buildings for decades. In fact, I think you know, the first time I met you, we were filming a CNA documentary and interviewing you about um, low energy buildings and sustainable buildings. My question to you is, how has the building industry evolved and responded to this urgent need to get to net zero cities? And what are some of the major challenges that you faced along the way? Well, thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon with our distinguished panel of colleagues here. Um, yeah, the work on net zero uh, targets have been ongoing for at least two decades already, as has been said. And our partnership with CDL is one very real example, you know, being done here locally uh, and in this region. Um, the fruits of those work have, can be seen um, around the world. Right, the green building movement has matured uh, since its you know, formation uh, back to more than two decades ago. Countries have adopted uh, increasingly stringent targets and benchmarks for green buildings, energy efficiency, um, and that has begun to show results. However, um, what's the challenge? I was reading a report recently, a 2020 report uh, produced by the UN uh, called the Global Status Report for Building and Construction, 
what it reported is that the global building energy consumption, now I'm talking about consumption now, has more or less remained stable over the last few years. And we attribute that to, as I said, the re reasonable success of the green building movement and the kind of benchmarking of energy efficiency and consumption. So that shows. However, the total CO2 emission in the construction industry and the built environment has hit an all-time high in 2019. So here lies this paradox. What is causing this issue? On the one hand, we seem to be managing consumption well, but yet as an industry, we are still growing and uh, doesn't seem to be an end to that. The report suggested that part of it has to do with the power uh, energy generation in terms of the shift to electrification and of course the, the transmission, the inefficiency in some of those has been uh, attributed at one cause. But the other, in my own view, and now speaking as an architect, um, has to do with the work at the ground. How, not just how we design our buildings to meet those codes, but perhaps even more importantly, how do we operate and manage those buildings? That's where the problem is, in my opinion. And in my limited experiences working on projects around the world, I observe that continuously. We check off all the boxes, we do the paper-based design, get it commissioned, and we walk away. And somehow, magically, we hope it will continue to operate like that. The fact of the matter is it doesn't. And the challenge of continuously pushing technology which on the one hand, we tout as an enabling right, feature or features to enable us to get better and better efficiency out of our buildings. What we tend to neglect is the effort and the knowledge and the education that needs to go into training those people who have to operate these buildings with all these smart technologies day in and day out. There is a gap. Even in our own small example at NUS, as many of you may have read, uh, we built our first net zero energy building. We've now retrofitted our existing building to super low energy. We have many, many lessons there to actually illustrate where the entire value chain of our industry are not necessarily uh, coherent. And there are gaps and we need to plug those gaps. So for new build, there is a challenge, even though uh, we supposedly have the freedom and flexibility to do the best we can to hit net zero. The other major challenge is the huge existing building stock that we have. And every day we talk, that efficiency is dropping. And the general kind of uh, 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 attitude is that let's not fix it if it ain't broken. Let it run till it dies and then we'll fix it. That is causing huge, huge uh, problems in terms of tipping the balance of our CO2 emission and energy consumption. So to me, those are really serious, serious issues that we need to begin to look at in the way we allocate resources. A lot of talk about finance, you know, uh, uh, for new construction, new infrastructure, all very good. But I think attention to the existing building stock and invest in the people, in the education and training of people who have to deal with those buildings day in, day out. It's equally, if not, in my opinion, more important. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was very fascinating, especially the point about investing in people and really transitioning the workforce, right? Whether it's energy or buildings, that's something that's really important. Wayne, I'd like to come to you. Of course, we have the trillion dollar question for you because money talks, obviously. Trillion Four trillion dollar question, actually. <laughs> yeah. How has UBS approached its investment strategies and how are you playing a role in this net zero movement? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the one thing that I take from today's 
discussion and a lot of discussions I've heard um, in the last couple of years is urgency. And it's that urgency that we have as an organisation. Um, and that urgency goes to um, the sheer mind-blowing pace that I've experienced uh, over the last couple of years of the development of different ways in which we can mobilise capital. Um, and that's the key, because for, for UBS, it's not just the capital that we're mobilising for ourselves, but it's the way in which we try to encourage our clients to direct their capital. Uh, it's the way in which we choose fund managers who direct capital on our behalf. Um, for example, recently, um, we have a joint venture with Rubico, uh, a well-known sustainable um, a portfolio manager, um, and that uh, joint venture was uh, to develop uh, an engagement strategy uh, and make sure that um, we're not just uh, saying no to some sectors and yes to others, but to try and bring those sectors that need to reduce emissions along for the ride um, and, to get, and to engage with them to actively reduce emissions as they develop going forward. And a great example of this is the energy crunch that we're seeing playing out uh, on a global basis. Um, now, particularly for developing countries, we need affordable energy. Without affordable energy, there will be greater impacts on consumption and household wealth and, and so forth. You can, you can set development back in that context. Um, from our perspective, we take a very pragmatic approach to this and we try to engage with uh, major energy producers um, to uh, improve their operational situation, um, to be moving in the right direction, to be mobilising capital to help them do that. Um, what we've seen is a proliferation of um, uh, the development of different ways in which finance we now engage with it. Um, things like green bonds, sustainable linked bonds, um, different other ways of financing development projects. Um, and so just as an example of this, um, this year we did Asia's first sustainable linked uh, uh, bond credit facility. Um, it was a property developer in, in the Greater Bay Area in China. Um, and uh, that property developer wanted to shift its um, electricity consumption in that whole development. And you can imagine uh, in the Greater Bay, these developments were significant. Um, and they wanted to tie that uh, to an ambition of 100% renewable over a, a period of years. Um, and how they've tied that and how we've tied that to the credit facility is that the ambitions, from, from an ambition perspective, if they fail to meet those ambitions, they then have to offset that carbon through the market um, uh, if, if they don't achieve that. And so that's how we can link, uh, because this is particularly important, is to link uh, financial uh, ambitions with outcomes. Uh, and that's something that not just us as the financial sector, and I guess um, uh, when we think about um, uh, um, in engaging in technology engaging in um, uh, ideas to uh, reduce vulnerability of communities and so forth, um, what we've seen is a lot of emphasis has been put on emissions reduction. Um, but we also need to put more emphasis on adaptation. And that's often been very difficult to do outside of developed markets um, because uh, we have uh, a lack of liquidity in certain markets or exchange rate risk or in, in, in risks that investors can't quantify. And that, of course, has made it much more difficult to engage in some of those projects. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, companies more generally, um, it, it has become a, a, a benchmark to um, uh, now be uh, producing sustainability reports, to be engaging with their shareholders and so forth. And that, of course, has made it easier to monitor, uh, uh, create impact and so forth. So the opportunities are definitely there. It's a $4 trillion opportunity per year. Um, the IEA, I think, estimated that uh, to bring about a, a renewable energy transition um, uh, to meet our targets, not just 2050, but 2030, um, and particular to um, uh, reduce our methane emissions as well, which have a significant impact, um, that would take about uh, $4 trillion a year. Um, just thinking about the Asia uh, bonds market, for example, um, uh, 2016, we did about $500 million worth of green bonds. Uh, today, we're doing about $3.5 billion 
or maybe a bit more, and we think that that will continue to grow, if not double, in the next couple of years. So the motivation is there, the urgency is there. Um, it's just a matter of making sure that government policy comes along with the financial sector, um, because externalities need to be internalised. And internalising those externalities largely has to be sometimes on the behalf of governments. And so we really need that emphasis as well um, uh, to accelerate that transition. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wayne. I really like what I'm hearing about the urgency in the finance sector. And I think you mentioned something very interesting about government policy. And perhaps at this point, I can turn back to High Commissioner. I mean, Kara, having heard all the perspectives here and also um, that, you know, at the moment we're seeing government policy lag behind what finance is doing or corporate pledges, what are you hoping to see out of COP26 from the government? Well, we now have 90% um, of global GDP that is covered by net zero commitments. Um, when we took on the COP presidency, incoming COP presidency, it's a very mouthy title, um, in December 2019, that figure was 30%. So um, we've gone from 30% to 90% in that amount of time. Now, of course, we have to make sure that everybody can meet those, and it's partly to do with what governments can do to plug the financing gap. Uh, I was talking about the public financing commitments of uh, 100 billion a year. You're talking about a gap of $4 trillion a year. That just shows that there is a space for government to kind of de-risk a bit the early and give people confidence so that private sector um, uh, investors can come in and invest in the most transformational projects. So I think we can see a really clear role for governments and for development banks and uh, people like us with our uh, development funding to uh, work on those kind of issues. Uh, but I think now people, are, yeah, governments have been making these commitments and I really like the fact that everybody's talking about urgency. I uh, think it's part of our responsibility as well to make sure that nobody misses out on that urgency. If we can see the way that finance is moving in the way that Wayne has set out, in the way that I hear in every single conversation that I'm having uh, in Singapore with major corporates, we need to make sure that the whole of the economy understands that and that they need to be grasping um, the challenge really quickly and coming up with actionable plans with support where necessary from governments, from development banks, from experts in the field uh, so that they can start making that transition as soon as possible. Because um, while I agree that urgency is very important, so is hope. <laughs> Um, uh, it's, there's no point just running around saying how urgent this problem is and it's all going to be a disaster if we don't get on with it. There also has to be hope uh, that if you do something about it, it's going to make a difference. Um, and so having really clear transition plans that are underpinned by very strong strategies, as we have seen in, in, and, and as we're developing in the UK, and as we can help share and support other countries as they're doing it, um, uh, I think that's what you need. Um, I've been really struck by the shift that's happening in ASEAN. It was really clear at the Singapore Energy Week. That was a different conversation that we were having at this Energy Week than it was a year ago. Um, ministers from ASEAN countries were either there physically or beaming in saying, you know, we've had really helpful energy transition councils. This is what we're gonna do. And we can see after country after country in ASEAN has come forward with a firm date uh, on net zero. And I completely agree with what Esther says. Um, our experience is that if you put the stake in the ground, the investment and the innovation is unleashed uh, to enable um, companies to truly adjust, to be able to articulate to their shareholders, this is why we need to move, because we're going to be in a position where our assets are stranded or we can't get insurance or we can get no further investment to growth. Uh, but that comes from the signaling that you get from governments, which is why we've been so focused and so broken record mm. on the idea of setting uh, very clear net zero dates with actionable plans uh, underpinning them. Wonderful. Actually, on that part, maybe I'll bring it closer to Asia. I mean, you've mentioned that the momentum in the region is absolutely, um, you know, gaining ground. But if you look at Asia as a whole, I mean, it's so heterogeneous. You have Singapore, you have Myanmar, you have China, and they are all in varying points of their development journey. How realistic is it to really expect these countries to achieve net zero cities? And maybe I can get Professor's view on this as well after you. Yeah, so I think if we go into this ignoring the fact that this transition is going to be hard, we're going to be absolutely fail. Um, just as we did in a previous 
um, stage of our history. Uh, we have had periods ourselves of high carbon growth, and it's true that the amazing growth rates that have been seen uh, across ASEAN um, in particular have been uh, fueled by high carbon growth. Um, uh, so I think, yes, there are challenges in there, but the interesting thing is that the econo economics have totally shifted. So um, you hear companies like Semcor, for example, can tell really compelling stories about how just a matter of years ago, a strike rate or a financing deal was way more expensive for um, green projects than it was for traditional projects. And that has totally flipped. Um, so actually, um, I think it's going to be becoming harder for governments to justify making the old choices because they're going to be um, more expensive, not just in the long run, but probably in the short and medium term, quite quickly. The, the scale of the change, uh, I think, is amazing. And the fact that so many other countries have gone through this and have so much experience to share, it's definitely a key part of what we're talking to ASEAN about with the newest dialogue partnership, and it's absolutely front and center in our mind. How can we use our money? How can we use our expertise? How can we use our signaling to support ASEAN countries in making this transition? How can we use our companies and our private sector expertise to partner uh, as they go along that transition? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Professor, I'll come to you. I mean, you've had experience, you know, working in cities all over the world. How realistic is a net zero city target for cities in Asia? Well, I personally think it is completely doable. It's really not an issue of technology. It's an issue of lifestyle and expectations. Um, Remember, we all came started from somewhere where we did not have all this huge amount of energy at different levels of growth, right? For Singapore, it was near 60 years. And we could remember back, I could still remember as a kid, right? The, the river was polluted and it stings and people were just drying their clothes, right? Without all these gadgets. We all started somewhere. And I think in the growth path, we need to go back and look at some of those passive approaches to developing our cities. Passive meaning using nature, using you know, what Mother Nature has given us and develop, plan and build our cities and buildings in a climate responsive way, rather than adopting what I call an international style that doesn't matter whether you're in Alaska or you're in Singapore, it's just the same. Clearly, something is amiss in that kind of thinking and approach. So I think there needs to be a real change in the kind of mindset, uh, particularly from people who develop buildings like CDL, um, which they do, right? They appreciate that. And then going back to understanding some of the fundamental sciences of design, right? Given the climate that we are. And then build on that. And to be able to selectively say what is really essential and what is good to have. And so we can then prioritize. It's amazing what you can do if we just take that very simple uh, step of understanding the climate, understanding the traditional architectural design style that we have um, in different locations and extract them and then make them contemporary. Of course, I'm now talking about being an architect, being creative and imaginative about such things. That, um, that needs to be relooked at in a very, very um, you know, focused way. And that's how we get to net zero in our buildings, right? We deploy uh, first uh, a lot of passive uh, technologies. Uh, shading, for example, in our tropics is so fundamental. Lots of good ventilation. Don't make bulky, blocky buildings. Um, that's another very simple, in my opinion, way of doing it. Now, that it does mean that the mindset of what you are buying in terms of real estate <laughs> uh, needs to be questioned, right? Uh, are you buying square meters, square feet, or are you buying volumes? Mm. Right? I've said this in one of the other sessions. Uh, I think the real estate market should talk about dollar per cubic meter instead of dollar per square meter. 
Pandemic taught us that, by the way. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is something that I, I believe we can do. And it's not about whether you are, can afford it or you can't afford it. You've got to go back to that condition, the circumstance that you are in, and don't just follow others blindly um, and therefore constantly having to do catch up and uh, uh, require resources that actually can be saved in an optimal way. So I think that is really an important strategy um, and, and a kind of a behavioral change as, I will, as, as it will. Thank, Thank you. Can I chime in, yes, chime in with challenges? <laughs> okay, I think if you want to change your lifestyle back to like 20, 30 years ago, it will be very, very difficult. So I think I totally agree that it has to be starting from the uh, design and also how you build it and everything. So technology is actually very important in, in my opinion. That I mean, we do have a digital technology that can help us actually, you know, um, decide on the orientation of a building and also also maximizing the, the you know the ventilations and all and we do have actual project that have actually helped us reduce heat gain by 20% right from the drawing board and then of course I love the you know nature you know based solution but I tell you a little story that you know we have this uh, tree house condominium 24 story high the vertical greenery I, I'm sure some of you do remember that that was the only building um, that we make it to the uh, Guinness Books of Record for the largest uh, green wall. It's still there. It's an iconic building. And uh, when we first started, when we hand over the, you know, to M MCST, there a lot of complaints. So a lot of uh, residents do not re did not really appreciate the so-called biophilic design, and we called it a biophobia. And then they were saying that, are you sure? You know, there are a lot of creepy crawlies. You know, and a lot of flying things in my room, you know. But there are some also appreciated. It's all oh, nice, you know. It actually really shade, you know, provide the shading. And uh, we engage uh, the School of Design and Environment at that time for one year uh, survey. It really helped us reduce temperature by up to three degree. It is really working. It's not rocket science. It just provide greenery. Okay. So that is something that not everybody appreciated in the beginning. And in fact, we also have a lot of concern. It's like, oh, you are going to pass the maintenance cost to us, right? You know, developer, you can't just walk away, right? But today, when we did our BBC, you know, uh, a video in June, they almost rolled out a red carpet for us. It's like, oh, yeah, it's so good, you know. Resale value very high, you know. Come, 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 bring the media here, you know. So I think people's mindset will change. Mm. But you need to, you know, have that trigger that, why you know nature-based solutions is so important nowadays, and in fact, um, we did always put in a lot of uh, uh, site area for our you know development, not to market it, but it's a fact that we appreciate greenery, and in fact, a lot of residents appreciate it very much, especially over the last 18, 20 months. Our home is not just home; it's office, it's social space, it's almost everything. So if your space is too small and no greenery, no nothing, I, I think I'll go crazy. So I think that is what we are looking at to provide future-proof the so-called design and uh, of you know to meet the the needs of tomorrow, and even farming, herbal farming, you know, indoor farming is a very in thing now because the 30 by 30 green plan, you know, and uh, in fact, even for us as we're talking, we actually, you know, piloted a very successful indoor farming in our academy, in our sustainability academy. Every three weeks, we actually harvest really, really nice, fresh greenery, uh, green vegetables. So we need to be almost like self-sufficient, but not compromising too much on comfort. Otherwise, I can't sell my property, La Prof. Yeah. Esther, just building on what you said, right? Um, at the recent Ecosperity conference that Temasek hosted, um, Sunny Vergis, who is Olam's CEO, you know, basically said, many corporate titans have basically pledged net zero, but have no idea how to get there. So my question for you is, CDA has pledged net zero, and after you share about, you know, the nature-based solutions and technologies, do you feel that the existing technologies that we are seeing today will help you get to net zero realistically or the finance pathways are there or is it still a long way to go and everyone's just making these targets because they're not going to be around in 2050? Well, I think uh, as a responsible corporate, I don't want to just jump, I'll be very famous if I say that, yeah, yeah, net zero, 2050, I retire already anyway. So, <laughs> but, so now you really have to be very calculative very specific. I will look at the corporates, what do you mean by net zero? What is your definition? 
And that's why we actually pledged to World Green Building, which is actually, World Green Council is the apex organization, you know, with very clear pathway, very clear KPI. What do you commit? What do you track? And how do you act on it? And how do you also advocate it? You can go onto the website. What we do is we look at progressively, not just like, oh, net zero, full stop. But what exactly net zero? So we have actually make it very clear, it's, on, it's, it's online. 13 SS under our direct management. 340 over 1,000 square meter of space. And then almost 67,000 tons of CO2 emission. And uh, the corporate office over 400 people. Okay? So all these will be net zero by 2030. By on-site or off-site renewable, by raising energy efficiency, you have to be very specific. You can't just say that, yes, I'm pledging net zero by 2030, but I don't know how I cannot, you know. I'm not saying that other, not, but we, for, we want to be more prudent. Ambitious is important, but you also need to answer to your stakeholders. We are a listed company. We need to be responsible to, for, for what we, we pledge. So we must have a very clear pathway, action plan, and I can't tell you that, you know, I, I, I will show you whether I can do it by 2029. So you need to update it, your sustainability report. In fact, it is you know, on our website online. You know, we even have a, a quarterly report on our key major goals as well. So uh, today, the whole world is very transparent. And I think it is really, really hard for you know, any companies to do greenwashing, if you ask me. You look clearly into the you know, public domain, you will find all the data and you can make the decision yourself. But I do respect that. There are a lot of CEOs like, I respect that, that they, they, they make a bold pledge. And uh, to tell the truth, a lot of people, I also don't have answer. Because technology moves so fast, change so fast. I cannot tell you specific technology I'm going to use five years down the road. I can only tell you that we have been always scouting for new technology, new innovation, new solutions. And uh, Prof is very right. People spend about 90% of their time indoor. So how you use your building is also very important. But that is really a major challenge to change people's behavior. But for corporate, you have to be very specific and very calculative mm. and uh, to share your information. Thanks so much, Esther. Um, at this point, I'd like to encourage everyone to send in their questions to our panellists. If you can uh, scan the QR code that's going to come up for you, whether virtually or in person, you get the opportunity. And in fact, I've actually seen a couple of questions already start coming in. Um, Wayne, I want to come to you because we've heard so much conversations about finance, technology, and in fact, there are all these different pathways. And that's why we've also structured this event to focus on the five roundtables, buildings, mobility, big data, AI, in the cloud, food and agri-tech, resources and circular economy. And I guess my question to you is that the climate crisis has often been phrased in a way where it's an emergency and there are all these threats. But in reality, there are actually a lot of opportunities. I mean, the number you know, of like impact funds, ESG funds, or the number of VCs going into this space has grown tremendously in recent years. Where do you see the investment opportunities here in Asia? And you know, what would your advice be, I guess, to all of us here in the room? Mm. I think that, that's a tremendous question. And, and um, I want to pick up on something that Esther said with respect to um, uh, particularly in things like agriculture. So a lot of supply chains are, very, are going to have more difficulty than others. Um, so, some are clearly pretty straightforward. Um, and in some cases, um, some places will find it more straightforward. Um, and Singapore has um, uh, a number of challenges, and they're meeting those challenges, particularly with respect to uh, food security um, and also with respect to energy security as we move forward. Um, and I think the pandemic... Um, there was no silver lining to a pandemic, and I don't believe the, you can't sort of categorise it that way. But let's say that the things that we learnt from the pandemic was the fragility of a lot of those supply chains. Um, and those supply chains are crucial to our existence here and, and, and how our neighbours are able to export their products to us um, and meet their own climate targets, etc. And we've heard a lot of discussion recently about um, the carbon border adjustment tax in, in Europe. Um, and we were just talking about then how businesses will need to uh, come up to some standards 
and um, the EU are probably on the front foot here with their taxonomy um, with respect to meeting those standards on all sustainable investments. Uh, because at the moment we have a number of different voluntary arrangements, we have different industry bodies who are conducting this and so forth. Um, and I think one of the key things, and I think something that Singapore has done a tremendous job of, is internalising that all into government processes and connecting all of those dots together uh, to try and come out with the solution. And I think the, the example of agriculture, 30% food secure, um, clearly um, there are um, a lot of impediments. Land area, for example, is one uh, impediment. Um, also, access to renewable energy. Now, you look at some of the efforts with a particular company in Australia uh, to build an infrastructure network to deliver renewable power uh, to Singapore. Um, and through that, it actually is delivering renewable power also to places in Indonesia uh, where that uh, particular cable comes through. And those innovations, or the complexity of that innovation, would have been seen to be impossible 10 years ago. Um, and it even seems difficult now, um, but similar to how we consider investments like hydrogen, for example, where it's just completely not economic right now. Um, it's not economic to, to have it in a number of settings. Um, but as we look forward 10 years, and I think this is where you know, we've almost got used to rapid technological change. And that's why, particularly for a place like Singapore, we're not starting from square one, right? We're already experimenting with autonomous driving. We already have a 5G network that's going to enable us to increase efficiency across the supply chain. Um, we're already thinking about how do we, um, uh, how do we monitor and, and track the goods that are coming into Singapore and the goods that are going out. And so when I think about some of the things that um, uh, I'll look back on in, in 10 years' time, um, some of these things around, for example, if, if us as a bank makes a commitment to offsetting our carbon emissions through owning a, a, a carbon sink of some kind, whether that be in agriculture, whether that be in forestry, whatever that might be, um, we need to be able to monitor it. Monitor it. We need to be able to verify it. Um, and all those things are going to come from uh, the Internet of Things, from big data, uh, from the 5G network, etc. And we're not starting from square one uh, here. And, and we have this experience, and we made that point earlier about um, the less developed countries in our region. And we have that experience and that leadership um, that will spill over into those countries. And just, um, just on that, um, one of the really exciting things that I've seen recently, and I, I won't mention the company, but it, country, but it is a sovereign nation, who is now looking to um, almost exclusively um, move into uh, uh, financing their own fiscal needs through linking that to the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and, and, and engaging in that way through um, being able to make real change, not just in their country but more broadly. And I think those things are really exciting when you see um, uh, particularly the countries in our region um, starting to really pursue this with a great passion. So um, some, of the, some of the technology we already have today, some of the technology is in its infancy, um, and some of the technologies um, we, we haven't even really engaged with yet, um, uh, uh, such as we talked about agriculture. We've only just started to think about producing agriculture inside. We've only just started to just scratch the surface, and, and there's a couple of companies in Singapore which are particularly predominant globally in um, the um, cell-based agriculture. So, you know, um, uh, what some people might determine as, what do they call it, um, uh, fake meat, for alternative example. Protein, yeah? Yeah. For those alternative proteins, um, which have a double benefit, i.e. we take the burden off of, um, off of agriculture to continue to step up um, and meet demand for protein, but at the same time, it has the benefit of improving welfare for animals. Uh, it has the benefit of reducing emissions overall across the supply chain. So I think those things are the things that I'm super excited about, um, particularly living here, having gone through the pandemic and you know, seeing some of the supermarket shelves not as stocked as we would have liked, uh, finding ourselves with ridiculous amounts of toilet paper <laughs> sitting in the, uh, in, in the pantry. Um, so I think those sort of things, um, to me, which are very exciting, and they're the things that we are digging deeper into 
um, uh, to be a little bit more complex and to help clients get better access to those things which traditionally clients have shied away from mm. uh, because of those complexities and because of the difficulties in, in um, sometimes understanding the risks of those investments. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. I was going to ask what would you put your money on, but it sounds like it's a, a oh, number it's always, of things. It's always agriculture, but I have to <laughs> concede uh, I have a farm in Australia which we we're trying to turn carbon neutral as well, so I have a bit of an implied uh, bias there. Yes, that's right. Thank you for that. Jessica, oh, can I yeah. sort of uh, add a comment yes, sure. uh, in response to both you know, Wayne and Esther? I think it's important uh, to clarify that if we go back to the reason why we built, it's really for the people. And so if we start with the needs of the community, the people, then you will take a much more holistic view. Uh, even the issue of comfort that was mentioned. You know, right now, the only definition of comfort that is commonly accepted is the thermostat in our buildings. That's far from being comfortable as a holistic you know, human need, right? Right now, I can tell you I'm really uncomfortable with the glaring light. This <laughs> is really glary, right? <laughs> Very dis Sorry, trying to give the uh, Hollywood effect. <laughs> I know. And all, there's always going to be some reason why we do what we do. But the question is, is that the only way of doing things, right? Because we are used to a certain way of doing things, therefore we continue business as usual. When we did our SD4, we aim not only for net zero with the strategy of doing not without technology, but with technology in an appropriate way. And the appropriate and relevant technology, we then are able to bring in a hybrid approach Right? Taking air conditioning with the traditional ceiling fan, which has been around for decades when we did not have all the luxury of air conditioning. There are ways to combine them, and we have demonstrated that in uh, our SD4 in order to get to net zero. And without sacrificing comfort, so often we pay so much for electricity and energy, and we are freezing in our offices. Right? We have to wear jackets and so on. And that is just a temperature. What about air quality? And the pandemic has taught us a very, very expensive lesson, right? That we need to deal with the air, we need to deal with. And in our SD4, we, based on the hybrid system, we are able to bring in 100% outside air to our condition spaces. Now, most engineers will say, well, that no way can you save energy. Well, we managed it. Right? So it's about those kind of inventiveness and creativity, not to take things as is and come up with the uh, sort of synergy of traditional and new to get the best optimal effect. That's what we did. And to extend the notion of comfort to health and wellness. Because by giving you 100% outside air, guess what? We're not too worried about this contamination indoor because the, whole, the air is being flushed out 100%. So not only were we first net zero, we were also the first well-certified building here in Singapore. And when the pandemic hit, we even went and, and continued to push for this health and safety rating uh, coming out of the International Well Building Institute because of a very, very systematic way to operate, manage, maintain, and clean the building. So. Those are the kind of life cycle, the holistic approach to our built environment that I'm trying to uh, bring across. Uh, and we can definitely scale that up without much trouble. Thanks very much, Prof. We have uh, lots of questions coming in now. I'm going to pick one of this because I was going to ask this question as well. And that is, we have heard a lot in the media about government support for reaching net zero goals and providing subsidies or increasing financing for sustainable infrastructure and investment. But how do the panelists feel about taxes and other forms of disincentives as signposts to a net zero future. And I picked this question because, Wayne, you mentioned the cross-border tax adjustment, which the EU is rolling out. And that really is trying to you know, make the landscape more competitive and a more even playing field. Um, anyone would like to venture a stab at taxes? And I think linked to this is also the carbon emissions, uh, the offsets market that is coming into place. Well, 
uh, as a company with 20 uh, presence in 29 countries and regions, we are not just looking at Singapore's you know, carbon tax, which is for the moment is still friendly, eh? but don't quote me. So, but the other part of the world are not so. And then, I mean, you can really see it coming already. Regulation, not just about tax, but also other aspects of regulations are coming really fast and furious. I mean, you look at SGX also making climate reporting, you know, mandatory TCFD coming in three years and you know everything you can see the regulations is really driving you know uh, uh, very fast and uh, that is also why when we run a business now we don't look at yesterday or today we need to look at climate change scenario planning and uh, actually we have conducted two climate change scenario planning one in 2018 based on two degrees and four degree warmer scenario that was before IPCC the fifth report come out and then after that we are looking at just 1.5 and two degree four degree out of the window already then as we were finishing, we were hit by COVID. So there are actually a new set of problems, challenges and risks that facing us, not just climate alone, but climate related, you know, um, you know, supply chain related thing. So we have to look at all these transitional physical, you know, risks, everything that is an impact on your financial performance. So we put a price tag to it, what is the likely impact? And of course, tax is one of it, but it's not all. So we need to look at what exactly will happen. You know, even insurance, just now I talk about that actually um, it is expected to really raise, uh, go up very high for insurance premium, especially if you have property or assets in countries or cities that has high, you know, um, uh, uh, climate challenge places. So I think running a business nowadays is really very difficult. You look at policy, you look at physical climate, you look at, you know, um, you know, tenants preference, home buyers preference, and even, you know, certain thing that I love it, you may hate it. So it's so difficult to please people. And that's what's also why when we talk about green building and sustainable building nowadays, we are not just looking at infrastructure. There are three things that, you know, World GBC actually is pushing forward. It's like we build sustainable buildings, you know, to fight climate change and also resilience economies and also resilient for people. People are, in the end of the day, most important. Yeah. Mm, thank you, Asakara. Um, yeah, so, of course, I think they go hand in hand. If we, if we go back to pre-Paris, none of the science around any of this has changed very much since before Paris. But actually, what Paris did was change the private sector's calculation of what things cost. Uh, and that is why the private sector has shifted so fast um, since 2015. And that is why at COP26 we need to complete that transition, um, both uh, with very clear targets set around net zero, but also completing the rule book so that we can properly, properly calculate costs to enable us to trade, for example, uh, uh, in carbon, and so that we can regulate it. I'm really, I'm really struck by how fast regulators, including in this region, are starting to move. So talking about an ASEAN te techno technology, taxonomy. Um, and Singapore has been playing a really leading role in that with its own um, uh, task force, um, developing the rules and the regulation. I'm also struck that actually, if you talk about taxes, this is one of the countries, one of the few countries in the region that actually has a carbon tax. Um, and many people would say that that was lower than the reality. And actually, if you talk to some of the best performing companies, they have an internal carbon pricing that is way higher than what the legal requirement is in Singapore at the moment. And it was really good to see the Minister of Finance pointing towards the next budget and expecting, getting everybody to expect that this is gonna be changing, it's gonna be in a trajectory. But in some ways, actually governments will be catching up with the decisions that private sector has already uh, made. Mm. Absolutely, a lot of good progress that we're seeing. We're getting some questions about the circular economy here. So I just want to perhaps shift that conversation a little. And I think that if we talk about net zero cities, the conversation around um, our resource management is absolutely key. And the question here really is, there are about two questions here, but if I could summarize it, you know, which stakeholder, whether it's governments, corporates, finance, industry, technologies, um, which stakeholder has a bigger gap to fill? to transform the city into a circular one. I guess the question is, where are the gaps now for us actually really achieving circularity in cities, and how do we get there? Anyone? It's silence. 
<laughs> Prof, perhaps okay. I go. Oh, Bean, go on. <laughs> I, 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 just want to make, uh, I just want to make a couple of points. First one is related to the previous question. Um, the, the carbon border adjustment tax in the EU and potentially in other countries um, is largely to make sure that we just don't offshore our carbon emissions. And so it's really, um, because I'm, I'm an economist and I'm a free market economist, so um, I still maybe foolishly believe that prices can equilibrate behavior. And the reason why we have pollution today is because those externalities are not correctly priced. Um, and there are people who are not paying that price. Uh, and there are people who are going to pay that price that never engaged in that activity, uh, such as uh, potentially in the South Pacific Islands, for example. And so, um, for me, the, the, the tax argument is about it being a suite of, of, of policies that are all working together to bring about that costing of the externality or putting a more um, uh, transparent price on carbon. And I think the OECD, and we were talking about this at the table for you, um, I think the OECD has um, uh, done a great leadership role on, for example, uh, global corporate taxation. And I think their mindset to then shift that now to uh, a global um, uh, effort to have a global carbon price where people are able to trade carbon emissions uh, transparently on a global basis um, will unlock enormous amounts of value for particularly not so much just for current developed countries but developing countries where you know they have significant forests for example that can be used to offset and so forth so I think that's a, that's an area that that people shouldn't be looking at climate change as a cost they should be as you said at the beginning it should be being thought about as an opportunity not just for employment but also for countries to monetize uh, some of the um, some of the um, uh, previous efforts they've done um, just on this question though um, I think the um, the, the key for me is around infrastructure um, and um, particularly I talked about the supply chains earlier you know many of you probably have read this you know 30 percent or 35 percent of the world's food is wasted in in the transition from from farm to uh, to plate um, now focusing on that infrastructure in our region in particular uh, it has to do with making sure the cold chain is effective, uh, making sure the cold chain is not broken uh, so that people can get delivered that food, they pay the appropriate price for that food and that food is consumed and how we think about uh, going about that. And so I think from at least my perspective, uh, one key challenge we have in the region, not so much here because we are very well resourced here, but in the region more generally, um, being able to uh, ship food and be able to take delivery of food um, and have those uh, uh, robust supply chains is one thing. Um, another one, of course, uh, for Singapore is water. And the reticulation of water infrastructure um, is not just important here, but it's important in places in Indonesia. You know, we don't think about this, but, but you know, we think, oh, well, Indonesia, it rains all the time, right? So there's no problem. But, of course, water storage uh, and, and capture of that storage and utilising that water appropriately uh, is very difficult. And if we want to think about climate, as uh, the granddaddy of risks. Uh, the availability of fresh water is pretty close to next to it, if not just behind it. Uh, and it's also interrelated to, uh, to that. So I think um, those investments, to me particularly regionally, are extremely important. Yeah. Thank you. Paul. Yeah, OK. Um, perhaps I will start with a kind of a philosophical thought about circularity. The differentiation between what we need versus what we want and, uh, and that drives, right, the kind of growth. Just because we use the word circularity doesn't mean that it's a zero-sum game. If we do not deal with the, all this uh, constant growth, um, and I think that's something that we need to strategically look at, what is absolutely needed and what we want because of the ability financially or otherwise. I'm not talking just about individuals, but as a nation. I think that's a question that we need to sit down and really think through very, very carefully. And the two are not necessary just because we have more stuff, it doesn't make us happier. We all know that, right? Uh, many studies have proven that. Um, and we need to even look into that, right? What is it that makes the people happy and, and most importantly now healthy. Now in the circular story, I would like to illustrate perhaps in the built environment and again in our cities, 
We've done well when it comes to um, energy efficiency in commercial buildings, um, to in residential, and to some extent, uh, industrial. The one sector that we have not been paying too much attention to is the health care sector, the mm -hmm. hospitals. Mm -hmm. And we all know that in this region, we are facing an aging population. That's a fact. And aging with aging comes all the medical and health needs. If we continue with the business as usual, in terms of the way we take care of our own personal and, and corporate and so lives, um, we're going to be confronting a huge problem moving forward. The energy consumption in hospitals are still going up, which offset all those savings that we have made. <laughs> so when we talk about circularity, we really need to look at every sector. And of course, that's the job of the government, um, because they are responsible for looking at all the different aspects and the, and, and the externalities. You see, the externalities of one is in fact the core of another. And we need to be able to take that holistic picture. Because healthcare, as we all know, cost is going up. And that could wipe out a lot of these other things that you know, we, we are saving on if we are not careful. Hence, the, the policy or, or the program that has just been launched here in Singapore, the Healthy District, the Health District, is one of those um, exam, exemplary program that really take, a, again, a very holistic and uh, ecological view of communities. And, uh, you know, something that I hope the audience will um, look up and, and, and follow. I think it's going to be a very exciting example of how we should look at this in totality. Can, can I just chime yeah. in with some positive examples, okay. you know, and creativities that's, you know, actually uh, founded on this circularity. And uh, circularity is actually a next level of the three R, the traditional reduce, reuse, recycle, right? So how do we close loop, turning ways to resources, turning ways to valuable, you know, um, uh, resources that we can, um, you know, use it for, um, you know, to close the loop. And uh, I think that is also what has driven impact investing and making it very exciting. And we have actually supported some of the you know r d and also some of the startups that turn an uh, orange peels into washing you know cleaning uh, agent and also even cassette tape into fashion into bags and all that and then the latest one is actually we want to solve two problems in the building sector which is the waste plastic waste and all that and turn it into you know building material, sand and cement. So these are the, all the exciting ideas that come up on the, you know, uh, the circularity uh, concept. And uh, I really like the idea because, I mean, we have limited resources. Uh, Singapore is very successful in terms of water story, so it is a circularity. And how, the, how could we apply it to other industry? I think we are really seeing light in the tunnel. I mean, you're also very into impact investing, and we even set up an a, you know, a incubator to help uh, uh, or this so-called social innovator to create positive impact. So I think that is, you know, also create new green economy and also new jobs. So I really like the idea of circularity. Thank you very much, Esther. With an eye on the time, I know a lot of questions have come in specifically on things like mobility, circularity, inclusivity. The opportunity to speak about this uh, in the roundtables and then in the closing plenary is coming up. Um, but I would like to just pose one final question to all our panellists here. And perhaps I'll start with Wayne and then we'll end with Kara. Uh, what is your hope for COP26 this week? And what is the most effective action that we can take? Wayne. Mm. So my hope is that we... Um, un unfortunately, we didn't have the largest emitters uh, in some cases in the room. And I'm hoping that the engagement after COP26 accelerates to those emitters uh, because that is crucial to us meeting our targets. Um, and my hope more generally is that um, we can bring forward some of the ambitions we have into 2030 and we can do that in a, um, a way that make sure that there's welfare attached to some of these changes. Because as we said, this is not gonna be free. Um, and it's incumbent on the wealthier countries to try and help and facilitate uh, that in some uh, less wealthy countries. Um, and so it's my hope that um, we uh, 
put forward credible ambitions, ambitions that bring forward the timeline. We've all seen the IPCC report. Um, they've really drilled down into various sectors. Um, and so the impacts are there, they're real, um, and they are very close uh, in timeline. Um, and so um, those things are probably where um, uh, uh, I, I would come out on, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Esther? Well, I really have very high hope. In fact, uh, after this panel, I'm packing up to fly to Glasgow already. And there are two things very important that um, COP25, it was never as exciting. I was there, but it was really quiet. And this year, they build up such high hope for, that, for everything. And then one whole week next week will be all on building sectors and, and all. So. Uh, we will be sharing the Asian voices about you know, uh, green buildings and a net zero building commitment and all. So this is one hope that I could you know, uh, uh, see, hopefully to see how they raise the bar for you know, real estate sector to contribute to the you know, global race to zero. And second one, we actually, maybe some of you have read in the newspaper also that I want to help the young people who really want to drive change because a lot of young people are feeling the so-called uh, Eco anxiety. 60% of people interviewed among the 10,000 people from 16 to 25 years old, all of them feel like very, you know, stressed by the, you know, the climate change, feeling hopeless and helpless. So we hope that we want to do this campaign of keep calm and love your farm, your, your planet. So uh, we, are, we are doing a lot of, you know, activities there next week and uh, engaging the Commonwealth pavilions, the ASEAN pavilion, and uh, hopefully these two young lady and uh, will come back with a lot of idea to engage the local community. Thank you, Esther. I think empowering the youth is very important and we just wrote a story about this at Eco Business today as well. And my favourite quote is still from Greta Thunberg, 30 years of blah, blah, blah. And I think, you know, the COP26 has to deliver, I think, a little bit more than that. And uh, the youth just have this way of like uh, straight talking. So I'm um, really watching, watching that. Prof, your, your turn. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I, I think, you know, the stage is being set and there is a great momentum um, to, to move forward. But at the end of the day, um, it's really in the details. And I think it is incumbent on each one of us, wherever we are, in whatever state of development, whatever profession, uh, to really roll up the sleeves and get it done. Um, I think at the end of the day, that's what's going to really, really matter. Uh, any gap in that whole chain will what I always call the weakest link, will actually disrupt a lot of the good stuff that other sectors might be doing. You know, that's just the laws of nature. They will find the weakest link and destroy it. Uh, so we really, really need to take every, however big or small the component is, to really roll up our sleeves and get things done. And at the end of the day, uh, we need to be accountable and certainly in the building industry, uh, one thing that I've advocated in terms of one good use of technology is that we need to continue to measure, continue to do diagnostics to see what really is happening in our buildings and in our cities. Uh, we need to do a lot more of that in order to really come to understand the consequences of every action that we take on the people. And the people's needs are very nicely summarized in their physiological, bodily, physical, psychological, as Esther has said, as of course sociological, as a community, and last but not least, economics. That one I don't need to convince anybody. But the, the second one now people are beginning to pay attention. Uh, uh, the first and second. Thank you. Thanks so much, Prof. Very well put. And last but not least, High Commissioner. So um, I talked before about Paris and about uh, the fact that Paris was a sea change and I have to say that that's what I want from Glasgow as well. I want it to become unthinkable for people to do the wrong thing because it's absolutely against their own self-interest. And so the messages that are coming out of COP, and yes, we didn't have some of the biggest emitters that were there at the World Leaders Summit, but you know, as the, as the fortnight goes through and as you get dominoes falling on who is committing to do what, for us, I've been saying a mouthful of the UK is the incoming COP president 
designate, and now we're actually the presidency, this doesn't stop during this fortnight. Um, there is a bigger coalition than ever before for us to get to net zero, and we just need to harness all of that momentum uh, and uh, a sense of urgency and hope um, that you can do it. Yes, it's urgent, but yes, we can do it if you all work together to really deeply change the culture. Absolutely, and I must congratulate the UK government for amassing 90% of GDP under a net zero commitment, and I think that that's a really positive note to end, and please join me to thank our opening plenary speakers. And uh, as we move into COP26, I hope that we will all see that action, and uh, I would like to thank all of you as well uh, for your participation and your questions. We are going to go into the round tables now, and I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Anna, who will brief you on how this round table would work. Um, but thank you again, speakers, and if I can, invite you to take a photo with, uh, at the front of the stage. Thank you.